Okay, welcome everybody to our second webinar on global legislative responses to the coronavirus, COVID-19. The event is co-organized by the Bingham Center for the Rule of Law and the journal, The Theory and Practice of Legislation. All the papers presented today and in our, our entire series of webinars are freely available on the website of The Theory and Practice of Legislation. I suggest you simply Google the words, The Theory and Practice of Legislation, and you'll be able to find all the articles. Uh, before we begin, I want to thank the Bingham Center and particularly uh, Ronan and Liam for uh, organizing this event and to thank all of you uh, for joining us from around the world. I will briefly um, present our wonderful speakers that we have today and then we'll begin. So our first speaker is uh, Dr. Ronan Kormarkian. He's a senior fellow at the Bingham Center for the Rule of Law. He's a consultant at Legislative Council and most importantly, an editor of the Theory and Practice of Legislation and co-editor of this uh, special issue. Uh, he will talk to us today about keeping COVID-19 emergency legislation socially distance from, uh, distant from ordinary legislation, principles for the structure of emergency legislation. Our next speaker will be Dr. Jan Petrov. He's a postdoc uh, researcher at the Judicial Studies Institute at uh, Masaryk University Faculty of Law in the Czech Republic. His research, his research focuses on uh, judi judicialization of politics by domestic and international courts and on questions of populism and separation of powers. He will talk about the COVID-19 emergency in the age of executive aggrandizement, aggrandizement uh, what role for legislative and judicial checks. Our next speaker would be Dr. Elena Grillo, I, I practice at home, is that correct, Elena? Uh, she's a senior parliamentary official at the Italian Senate and adjunct professor of legislative drafting in the Department of Political Sciences of Louis University in Rome. Uh, she's also the author of a monograph, Parliamentary Oversight of the Executives, Tool and Procedures in Europe, which is forthcoming from Hart Publishing, and I, for one, am looking forward to reading it. And uh, she will talk to us today about parliamentary oversight under the COVID-19 emergency. And, and uh, last but uh, uh, not least, uh, uh, our last uh, speaker is uh, Phil Lord from McGill University Faculty of Law in Canada. His research concerns law and religion, public law, and behavioral economics. He has authored over a dozen academic articles, and he will talk to us with, uh, about incentivizing employment during the COVID-19 pandemic. So what we'll do now is each speaker will have 10 minutes and then we'll have a few minutes for uh, Q&As. Uh, uh, participants who want to ask questions, you're very welcome to write me in the chat box and I will present your questions. So uh, without further ado, Ronan, please go ahead. Thank you, Itai, and thank you for those kind words. I would like to talk uh, today for a short while on social distancing of emergency legislation. I have one really simple idea which I want to get across to you today and this simple idea is that we must keep ordinary laws separate from emergency laws. We have a distinction, a distance between them and I'm using the concept of social distancing here to say that there must be a social distance between ordinary laws and emergency laws. And I will go on to explain why that is and how we can bring it about. Um, but this is the, the, the central core message that there is a distinction between these two. So let's look at the background behind this and examine how ordinary laws work and how emergency laws work. So beginning with the content of ordinary laws. Ordinary laws make incremental change. They build layer on layer of new laws over time. Sometimes that change can be radical. Normally it's a small change. Sometimes it can be radical. Very rarely we can say that a new law is truly revolutionary. So put that to one side and let's consider the content then of emergency laws. Now, emergency laws are not small steps of change, they're radical, they're revolutionary changes. 
and they introduce measures that we wouldn't normally, that we would never expect to see in everyday life. So we would never expect to pass a law, an ordinary law, which completely shuts down the economy, or pass a law that says people, the whole population cannot leave their homes. So the content of these laws is really draconian. Going back then to ordinary laws and looking at the process for making them, we have very set procedures for making ordinary laws and the way that we pass legislation, it's slow and ponderous. It takes a long time and it's deliberately set up to take a long time. We have a very standardized procedure for going through our parliament. We have consultations, we have procedures that we go out and ask people, this is the new law we are thinking of having. What do you think about this? Will this work? We have a long stage of policy development. Then we have a long stage of legal drafting when the actual draft of the law is worked upon. And then we have a long stages of parliamentary scrutiny and debate where the ideas for the law are discussed in parliament and we have the possibility for lots of amendments to those to those draft laws when they're in front of parliament. So put that on one side again and look at the process for emergency laws and this is lightning quick. We make the emergency laws in such a hurry that we have, don't have any time for any of the normal things that we do. We have official urgent or fast track or emergency procedures in our parliaments. We have no or else very limited consultation. We have very little time for policy development and for the legal drafting. We have very little time for parliamentary debate and scrutiny. And we have very little time for amendments um, to that legislation. So the content and the process for emergency laws and ordinary laws are very different. And now I come to the why. What is the risk? The risk is that emergency laws and ordinary laws become merged together like this, like my two hands clasping together. We become so used to the emergency laws that they become normalized for us. So that draconian content that I was talking about becomes normal. And that process of rushing legislation through becomes normalized within the parliament. And I say that this is a bad thing for our democracy, for lawmaking process, because we've already said that the things that we happen in during emergencies are not good in, in, the, in the long term. But the risk is that we've become so used to emergency laws that they become part and parcel of our normal procedure. And the other linked risk is that emergency laws are used for far too long, that even though the emergency might be over, we continue to have the emergency laws. So um, just looking at some of our panelists, I know that in Israel, the emergency law has existed since I think the foundation of the state. In the UK, emergency temporary terrorism laws continue to be renewed and renewed and renewed. In other jurisdictions, we have emergency laws which are used for purposes beyond the original purpose. So an emergency law might be enacted for one reason, and then two or three years later, the politicians, the government, the legislature think, well, we can use it for this purpose as well. So this is the real risk of those emergency laws merging with our ordinary laws and those emergency ideas and procedures infecting the normal way that we, that we make legislation. So this then is my suggested solution. And I'm calling it, using the medical terminology, social distancing of emergency legislation, maintaining a separate bubble between the emergency law here and the normal law here. And this is how we conceptualize the law this is how we regard it as being, this is a different thing we're doing now. We know that what we're doing is not normal. We're using this emergency law. It's, this, is not for, this is for the politicians when they're passing these laws and they know this is not normal. We wouldn't do this in ordinary times. It's for the police whenever they're using their powers. They think, well, this is an, I wouldn't normally be stopping people and asking them, why have you left your house? It's for the civil servants it's for the executive, it's for society to think this is a separate and distinct thing. So how we conceive of law helps us to 
to keep it separate and reduces the risk of those that contamination, that infection of the emergency procedures into our ordinary procedures. So what, how can we do it? If this is the, the principle of a separation between these two things, how can we do it? And I'm suggesting that there are structural techniques in how we create and how we enact our law that can really help us to keep this distance between the emergency law and the ordinary law. So I've color coded it here in this slide, the red for the emergency laws and the blue for the ordinary laws. So with the emergency law, we have a sunset clause that we say this law comes to an end at this particular date. With the ordinary law, it continues forever. It's a permanent law. We don't have an end date set on it. With the emergency law, we have a single legislative vehicle. We have this is the emergency law and all the powers that we are going to exercise are contained or sourced within this one law. This is very different from the rest of the statute book because ordinary laws, as I said before, they build up layer on layer on layer of different laws. A criminal justice act one year builds upon a criminal evidence act next year, which builds upon a police act the year after that. This is very different from the single legislative vehicle model. The next technique is a quite a, a detailed technical one, so I'll just explain it very briefly. When we have our emergency laws, we use non-textual amendments. So whenever we are interacting with the rest of the statute book, we don't change the actual words of the rest of the statute book. We just modify how they apply in certain cases. Whereas with ordinary laws, because it's a coherent whole, the statute book is a coherent whole, we use textual amendments to change the actual wording of the other statutes. The next structural way that we can do it is by making our emergency law appear like an aberration. It sticks up, it's out of place. If we consider the analogy of the statute book as a mosaic, where everything is smooth, everything fits together, everything interacts properly, we don't want that with emergency law. We want it to stick up, to be out of place. Whereas with the ordinary law, we're using tessellation, this idea of the different pits of the mosaic all mesh together properly without any, without any gaps between them. We, Sorry, one minute. Okay. Thank you. Um, whenever we're looking at the, we can make our emergency law expressly temporary. We can say on it, this is a temporary law. So in the, in the UK, we have um, emergency provisions or the Prevention of Terrorism Bracks Temporary Provisions Act. These are things which expressly say this is temporary and you wouldn't have that sort of temporary limitation in ordinary laws. Uh, I will conclude with the final point just on the names that we give the legislation. The name that we give to the legislation indicates its temporary nature, indicates it's separate and distinct from the rest of the statute book. So we can call things like the Coronavirus Emergency Act or the emergency provisions or the coronavirus or the COVID-19, we have something which says to the reader straight away and obviously this is separate, this is distinct. And this is goes back to the whole idea that we don't want these, we are, the emergency laws are necessary during the emergency, but we want to avoid the risk of them becoming normalized. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ronan, for uh, this insightful uh, presentation. It's, uh, very interesting. Uh, I have uh, uh, one question from the audience, and from there, I'll uh, ask my question as well. And other participants are more than welcome to uh, send additional questions. So uh, I will read uh, the question. James uh, uh, Sherritt has written, I particularly enjoy the fact that the 70 uh, miles per hour speed limit on motorways comes from the 70 mile per hour, 60 mile per hour, and 50 miles per hour uh, uh, temporary speed limit continuation order 1978, which provides that the temporary limitation apparently introduced to save fuel during the oil crisis are hereby continued indefinitely. 42 years later, it's still there. And uh, I would like to follow up on this uh, uh, very nice anecdote asking two related questions. 
One is how do you make sure that the temporary emergency provisions actually become temporary? The fact that you make it a sunset law, uh, uh, at least it, it tell, tell me a little differently if you think differently, but does not uh, uh, in itself ensures that tricks like uh, James has uh, sent us would not be uh, used. And the other, um, perhaps more provocative question, isn't it not, uh, in fact, dangerous to tell legislatures, listen, this is only a temporary emergency thing, because then they might actually, um, actually uh, 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 provide less scrutiny and be more willing to uh, support the law because they say, oh, it's only a temporary emergency measure. Um, thank you. And um, that's a really an excellent example um, of the risk of something which is introduced originally as a temporary measure and continues on. I, I wasn't aware of that particular provision, um, but I'm sure in our own jurisdictions we can think of similar ones. In fact, if my memory serves me correct, the arrangements for access to the holy sites in Jerusalem came about as a result of a temporary edict in the 1850s, and that temporary edict is still continuing to the day. To this day. So yes, this is the real risk that we introduce something as a quick fix for an emergency and unless we're very alert to the fact, um, it continues on, which is why it's so important to have something like a sunset clause, some sort of mechanism, some sort of trigger, some sort of device that parliament or somebody has to say, is this still necessary? Is this still justified? Are the original conditions still in force so that we still need to have this? Um, and that is one way that we have to guard against these draconian laws continuing in force. Um, in answer to your, your, your final question, Itai, that is a risk. The risk that if we call it temporary, Parliament will agree to it much more readily. Um, I, I think we have to accept that as being a risk but it is much more important that we make it temporary so we know that it will definitely come to an end. So even if it is a bad law, it's only gonna be a bad law for one or, or, or two years. Okay, and we have uh, time for one more question. I see Colin has raised a question which is very relevant to what you just said. So the question is, don't you need also to set up separate implementation structures? Well, I think this would be one other practical solution to this idea of social distancing. Um, I, I was nearly thinking in advance if the police could have separate hats when they're using uh, emergency laws and then ordinary laws. And unfortunately, I don't think it's, it's practical to go down to that level of detail. But if there was some separate way that, that the enforcement techniques could be seen as being, this is a separate and distinct thing. I think in practice though, um, during, during a pandemic, it's quite hard to administratively set up those separate implementation structures. So I think, though it's a useful idea and it's a useful way to conceive how we are imagining the, these emergency laws, I think in practice it might be a little bit difficult to do. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Ronan. And uh, we're moving on uh, to Jan Petrov. Jan, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. First of all, many thanks to the Bingham Center for hosting this event. And thanks are also due to Ron and Anitai for all their work with the special issue on legislative responses uh, to the COVID-19. And uh, in my 10 minutes here, I will present the main theoretical argument of um, my paper, full version of which appears in the special issue of uh, the theory and practice of legislation. And in my paper, I ask a, a, um, a basic question uh, of what uh, role should the legislative and judicial actors play in the COVID-19 emergency? And my inquiry is particularly uh, informed by the context of democratic erosion and executive aggrandizement which takes place in a number of countries around the world. And the starting point is that the constitutional state of emergency regularly leads to extraordinary empowerment of the executive. Uh, 
which is logical on the one hand because it's the executive from among the three branches who uh, mostly has what it needs to um, to overcome the emergency uh, but on the other hand in the current context of uh, rising populism uh, illiberalism and abusive constitutionalism there's also a significant risk of abusing such extraordinary powers uh, for the sake of power grabbing. And this creates a certain dilemma for, um, for the other two branches, for the legislature and the judiciary, as to how they should react. Because if they deploy their um, full-scale powers, perhaps they might be able to prevent the power grabbing scenario. But on the other hand, there's also uh, a risk that by uh, being too active, they may impair the executive's efforts to overcome the pandemic. And in uh, my paper, I, uh, I argue that the legislature and the judiciary should show some deference towards uh, the executive uh, level of which will depend on the uh, stage and severity of the crisis in the given moment. But more generally, I make a case for active involvement of the legislature and the judiciary in the emergency governance. So in other words, I am um, against uh, the other branches giving, giving way and uh, Bianco check to, to the executive. And for two reasons, first, there's the negative side, the possibility that the other two branches uh, can prevent the abuse of uh, emergency powers, and more importantly, uh, I also argue that the legislature and the judiciary can also positively um, improve the emergency governments, can increase the effectiveness of emergency measures by improving uh, conditions necessary for um, voluntary compliance. Uh, and in the rest of the presentation, I'll try to guide you through the, uh, through the argument, which may sound a bit counterintuitive at first, uh, especially because uh, an important position in the in the scholarship, especially in the U.S. constitutional scholarship, uh, is um, is an approach that heavily focuses on the executive and um, argues in favor of the executive unbound as uh, the most effective way of dealing with an emergency. However, this, this scholarship is pretty much built on wartime and counterterrorism emergencies. And it seems to me that the COVID-19 emergencies is, uh, um, is distinctive in several aspects. So there's no clear externally defined enemy. There's no group of evildoers that must be stopped. But what we fight against is an invisible infectious disease. Uh, and in order to stop the disease, we need a highly coordinated response built on uh, social distancing. And for this strategy to work effectively, we need extremely high rates of compliance. And the rates are so high that um, I'm afraid that the standard uh, approaches to top-down enforcement, such as policing, are, are not enough for reaching these high levels of uh, of compliance. So what is crucial is uh, voluntary compliance on part of the public. Uh, but looking at the, at the actual situations in a number of countries these days, it seems that voluntary compliance uh, can hardly be taken for granted. And I will name two main reasons, two main obstacles of voluntary compliance. Uh, the first one is lack of legitimacy, lack of trust in the emergency governance, uh, because a typical feature of the eroding democracies and countries which go through constitutional rot and similar processes uh, is very high social and political polarization. And as a result of that, the typical uh, process which we can see in emergencies, the rallying behind the flag, the nation uniting behind a strong le leadership is actually, according to recent research, is actually very short-lived in the COVID-19 emergency. And what we can see due to the polarization and lack of legitimacy of the emergency governance is the trend of fleeing the flag. Um, and the second reason is uh, the less lack of feasibility of emergency measures. And 
I'll be sure to hear uh, Ronan already mentioned it in his presentation that the emergency measures are typically made in rush uh, with little information. Uh, therefore, they nearly by definition will include uh, some legislative imperfections. They will include uh, inconsistencies, uh, unclarities. There may be over-inclusive or under-inclusive terms. And all of these issues may, um, may, uh, may be problematic for the feasibility of the emergency rules and for the very capacity of these rules to guide uh, people's behavior. And uh, by improving uh, conditions necessary for voluntary compliance and overcoming these obstacles, that is lack of legitimacy and feasibility, um, I believe the legislature and the judiciary can uh, can contribute to effective emergency governance. I believe that due to their uh, unique and typical institutional features and qualities, uh, they may improve both legitimacy and feasibility of the emergency policy policies. Because the legislature is a representative deliberative body which can check and discuss emergency measures, can provide feedback to the executive, and the MPs can um, voice the views and concerns of their constituents and this very knowledge that my political representatives to which uh, I can turn to have the opportunity to check and critically discuss the emergency governance should positively influence the legitimacy and trust in emergency governance. The judiciary then uh, is a venue for um, resolving individual conflicts related to the application of the emergency measures and uh, judges are also highly skilled in um, overcoming legislative imperfections by interpretation that's actually their uh, daily job and by that they can rectify some of the deficiencies in the emergency rules and improve their feasibility and finally the, the very knowledge again that there is an impartial venue where I can seek redress when I have a feeling that my rights were disproportionately affected by the emergency measures can contribute to higher legitimacy of the system as such. So in other words, the main takeaway message of my paper is that rather than the executive unbound, it's the three branches uh, together that can provide for maximum effectiveness of the uh, emergency governance and the, the logic arg of the argument is that uh, involvement of the legislature and the judiciary uh, can improve legitimacy and feasibility of emergency policies which in turn um, can improve voluntary compliance and thereby the effectiveness of the emergency policies. Which brings me uh, to the conclusion, so just to wrap it up I want to make sure that what I presented is a principled normative uh, theoretical argument which can serve as a certain threshold for assessing the actual performance of legislatures and judiciaries in, um, in the given countries. But I also hope there's recent research coming out uh, which actually shows a number of examples where the judicial and legislative checks actually uh, actually work in terms of uh, parliamentary oversight of the executive. Um, there's a brand new paper by Elena Grillo who will speak in a few minutes. So I'll stop here and I won't be stealing her time and uh, her topics and I'll just uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Jan. And just on the second, so thank you very much for keeping time as well and for your uh, very interesting and illuminating uh, presentation. Uh, before I, I go to uh, questions, uh, uh, I'll just mention that I see in the Q and A's that there are two questions that uh, arrived a bit late for uh, Ronan. So I suggest Ronan that if we'll have time after everybody's uh, 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 sp sp uh, uh, finished their presentations, maybe you can go back to uh, those two questions in the Q and A's. Uh, and meanwhile, I see that you want to begin with a question uh, for Jan. So uh, please, Ronan, go ahead. Um, 
Yeah, I found your, your, your insights really helpful, Jan, and um, I think you, your, your central core message is a really good one. But I had a question just to pick up on something you mentioned at the very end, and this is about judicial deference. And I'm wondering what degree of deference you think the judges should give to the executive bearing in mind that the judges don't have the scientific knowledge to be able to properly adjudicate on the effectiveness of the measures, to what extent do you think the judges should simply defer to what the executive say in their, their legislation? Yes, thank you, Ronan. That's, uh, that's an important question. And, uh, as I mentioned very briefly in the presentation, I think uh, it's it's very difficult to give a uh, give an abstract answer because it will always depend on the given situation uh, and the state of affairs in the in the given moment. So I think on the most general level, uh, the level of deference depends pretty much on the on the stage of the crisis and its severity. Because, for instance, at the beginning of the crisis. Uh, very scarce information, uh, very little uh, inspiration from abroad. So, the ex but the executive uh, feels a pressing need to do something, uh, and in that case, I think uh, this justifies uh, a, a broader deference, a broader uh, margin left uh, to the executive by by courts. But that can change uh, as the time passes when the crisis is not so severe and the executive gets more and more information then i think this may justify the judiciary to be a um uh to be a bit more demanding and to the to the second part of your question uh to what extent should the judicial deference depend on the lack of scientific uh, knowledge so uh, I think you're totally right that this is a this is an important feature, but we also uh, I think have to take into account the types of uh, judicial scrutiny because uh, what you probably have in mind is a uh, substantive review um, review of um, compliance with of the executive measures with substantive rights, but um, and there I think uh, it makes a lot of sense to defer. Uh, with respect to the to the expertise of the executive, which is uniquely placed to access um, access expertise, but on the other hand, looking at the at the current crisis, a lot of courts actually resorted to uh, to procedural review. So uh, rather than directly reviewing the substance, uh, they first checked uh, the, the the process and the way how the emergency rules uh, were were adopted. And there I think the, the deference based on the scientific knowledge uh, doesn't play uh, doesn't play much role because it's a typical procedural rule of law uh, aspect where the courts themselves are, uh, are, are experts. And in fact, the, the reliance on the procedure um, can, can help to, to secure that uh, thorough procedures and thorough decision-making processes where different voices, including different expert voices, uh, will be heard. Thank you, Jan. This is very interesting and it raises a few questions that I would be very tempted to ask, but uh, uh, we have another question from the audience and I will defer to them. So I'll just say that uh, the theory and practice of legislation published a special issue on evidence-based uh, judicial review and uh, this, I think, ties very nicely to uh, what you've just uh, discussed. And uh, I'll, I'll stop myself and uh, go back to the question by uh, Athena uh, Stafilia, and she uh, asked, should judgments on con unconstitutionality of parts of emergency laws be reenacted by the executive? And in what way? Should the courts uh, exercise, exercise their power with judicial self-restraint on that matter? And she continues and, and clarifies, even emergency, even emergency laws have targets and a justification. In some conditions, some emergency laws may surpass the limits of emergency laws as prescribed in the Constitution. In that case, the courts should be able to pronounce the unconstitutionality. Okay, so maybe uh, focus on the first uh, question. 
and uh, and I think this was a comment to the previous uh, question. So, so the question should I repeat the question, Jan, or are you fine? Yeah, maybe or uh, maybe if you can rephrase it, and I'll try to go through the question in the chat uh, myself. Meanwhile, uh, just to make okay. sure I'm responding on the point. Okay, so the question is: Should judgments on un unconstitutionality by the courts of parts of emergency laws be reenacted by the executive, and in what way? And should courts be more differential and exercise more, more self-restraint uh, uh, in uh, if it comes back to the courts again and they have to uh, re uh, review it once more? Yes. Um, so I believe again that the level of different uh, deference uh, depends on on many aspects. So I um, I expect the level of deference to be kind of a floating uh, feature depending on the contextual issues. And I think courts are actually capable of doing that. At least there's some empirical evidence from the counterterrorism um, emergencies when uh, at, at the beginning, right in the aftermath of the, of the terrorist uh, attacks, the courts were very deferential. But then uh, as the time passed by, they started uh, being more uh, demanding and the uh, strictness of their scrutiny uh, increased. And in terms of uh, reenacting, the, the executive reenacting the um, abolished emergency measures, so uh, I believe this depends on, on the reason of the uh, unconstitutionality or illegality. And if, if this question goes to the procedural review um, I, I talk about, then I think if the procedure in the second round is uh, the forcing procedure is complied with, uh, then I think it's okay if the if the executive reenacts the the measures. And in fact, I think uh, this is what ha has happened several times in the Czech Republic. Uh, and first instance, administrative court quashed uh, certain emergency measures because they were adopted by uh, the Ministry of Health. Whereas, according to the Crisis Management Act, they were supposed to be enacted by the government uh, as such, where a plurality of voices would be heard. And the government and the court actually did not uh, quash the emergency measures at the given moment, but it gave the government some time to um, rectify the process and enact the emergency measures once again. And the executive complied the very same day or, or the very next day. So in this way by the certain dialogue or cooperation of the judiciary and the, and the executive health and lives, the public health was uh, not endangered by a certain legal vacuum, uh, but the foreseen procedures, the rule of law was also uh, safeguarded. Thank you very much, Jan. And uh, we're moving uh, to the next uh, lecture by Elena Grillo. Elena, please. Okay, thank you very much to Ron and Nate for inviting me in this webinar, which gives me the opportunity of presenting the, the results of my research on parliamentary oversight under the COVID emergency. Uh, I will start with my presentation with a provocative question. Um, why we should care about parliamentary oversight under uh, a global crisis, which challenges most of our certainties, uh, which has changed our daily lives, uh, which has constrained our fundamental liberties and amper our economies. Is this concern for parliamentary oversight merely a theoretical issue, or uh, rather is it associated to substantial values? Well, to answer these questions, I think that, uh, I'm trying to, to um, to answer this question, I think that we should uh, start from considering the impact that the emergency has exercised on our representative democracies. The pandemic uh, has brought to its extreme consequences the trends towards executive dominance that were already underway in many European democracies. Uh, parliaments have been marginalized in the role of legislatures, and uh, this is true both at national level and at the European level, where the crisis has led to increased intergovernmentalism. However, it would be incorrect to state that parliaments have been the big absence of the pandemic. 
uh, besides the law making function, which has seriously been constrained, and Ronan was online in this, we need to look at how parliaments have dealt with another fundamental function, the oversight of the executive. And, um, sorry, I need to, okay. Um, if we focus our attention on parliamentary oversight, we can easily demonstrate that this function, especially if compared with lawmaking, offers several added values, which explain why this is not merely a theoretical issue. In my view, Parliament's capacity to provide continuity to oversight of the executive, even under the pandemic, is the essential factor for safeguarding the well-being of our representative democracies. And this is especially true in light of the extraordinary limitation of parliamentary work imposed by health concerns and restrictions. And I would like to offer two sets of arguments in support of this thesis. On the one hand, parliamentary oversight contributes to provide higher democratic standards, and I fully find myself in the arguments which have already been offered by Jan. Uh, parliamentary oversight is one way for balancing the restriction of or suspension of fundamental rights and liberties, which during the pandemic has been decided not just to statutory laws, but also to statutory instruments of administrative acts. Oversights provide high levels of participation, accountability, transparency, inclusiveness. It contributes to uh, increase the, the level of input and throughput democracy. Uh, where an emergency does not usually enable to make good laws, oversight is one way of fighting against bad quality of legislation. And also oversight offers parliament the opportunity to control the entire scope of government action, including the civil legislative and administrative act. On the other hand, parliamentary oversight offers some logistic facilities. Uh, many oversight procedures uh, take place in committee rather than in the plenary. They do not require minimum quorum or do not result in a vote. Uh, many procedures can take place uh, in a virtual or hybrid mode. And these are all competitive advantages under an, an emergency which has seriously constrained the possibility to conduct uh, parliamentary work in a physical presence. And here we have two images that clearly show how, um, how plenary meetings have changed their face. And now I move to the comparative overview. Um, on the one hand, we have uh, the image of the Italian Senate, where plenary meetings have been rearranged in order to ensure the contextual presence of 320 MPs with social distancing and you're using all the available spaces in the plenary room, including public galleries. On the other hand, uh, there's a picture from the UK House of Commons where the question time has been reorganized in a hybrid solution with a limited presence in the floor of the house and with other MPs raising questions to virtual connections. So this is just, uh, uh, these are just two photography shows which however can give an idea of the wide range of solutions adopted by parliaments um, to cope with the problem of granting continuity to parliamentary oversight even during the emergency. Um, on the ground of the procedures, there are six main fields of parliamentary practice in Europe under the emergencies. First of all, many parliaments have been asked to authorize the declaration or prorogation of the state of emergency or the allotment of special powers to the government. A parliament's capacity to have their say on this fundamental decision largely depends on formal laws and constitutions and rules of procedure. Second, um, parliaments have tried to gather information on the crisis. And they have done so mostly by asking prime ministers or delegated ministers to make a statement in committee or most often on the floor of the house. And this mechanism has raised two alternative procedures because we can have uh, government state, uh, statements with no further procedural follow up or we can have government statements followed by a vote on a parliamentary act, either a resolution or a motion. So the second option supports a more advanced interaction because it offers parliaments the opportunity to state their will and influence future executive action. Third, questioning. Questioning is among the most widely spread and effective oversight tools worldwide. During the pandemic, some parliaments suspended the possibility to raise oral questions, 
while others try to safeguard the question, the, the question time um, by resorting to virtual connections or other solutions. And this has offered a good opportunity, especially to opposition, I think, to state their will on what's going on, on, on the positions that the government, on the decisions that the government is adopting. Fourth, oversight in committee. Uh, committee work is continued in almost all parliaments, uh, often in a virtual or hybrid mode, and committees have made large use of earrings, inviting experts, stakeholders of government officials to provide information. Um, well, these new uh, virtual or hybrid practices have favored an informal style of parliamentary work, which in most cases, in my view, has represented a positive innovation because it has led to procedural flexibility and openness towards the civil society. Fifth, uh, some parliaments have tried to establish uh, ad hoc bodies in order to scrutinize government's work during the pandemic. This is the case of France, this is the case of Belgium, but I would like to mention also the experience of UK select committees, which are starting new inquiries on selected policy issues related to the pandemic. Uh, sixth, last but not least, uh, um, oversight of budgetary measures. Um, this has represented a crucial and rather divisive issue during the, the pandemic. Uh, I cannot provide uh, an extensive uh, uh, overview of the practices, but I would just like to mention some cases uh, um, of parliaments which have addressed policy directions to the government, um, asking them to account for the positions to be taken at the European level, at the meetings of the Eurogroup or the meetings of the European Councils, where they needed to decide the financial aids to be activated. And there are some cases from the Netherlands or from Italy where um, true resolutions parliaments were, say, were telling government whether to activate or not the European stability mechanism, for instance, just mechanisms. So, um, in a diachronic perspective, um, I think that we can argue that parliaments have followed a realistic and incremental approach to ensure continuity of executive oversight during the pandemic. And we can detect a three-layer framework of parliamentary oversight. Uh, the first stage is related to the activation of fact-finding mechanisms. Um, all parliaments have, in, have ensured continuity to the fact-finding mechanisms to hearings, informative missions, or government statements, and so forth. Um, and the aim of this procedure is to serve the very basic requirement of parliamentary oversight as a right to comprehensive information. Uh, most parliaments, but not all parliaments, um, have gone further. Uh, they have structured a public debate between MPs and members of government. And the advantage of these procedures, participatory procedures, is that they foster pluralism of opinions. They support inclusiveness, inclusiveness, but they do not enable parliament to vote on a single position, on a single act. The first stage is associated to deliberative mechanisms, and only a limited number of parliaments have been able to cover the first stage of the accountability process, which implies the possibility to have the will of parliament spelled out on certain proposals of documents which binds the government at least politically. So, in perspectives, I think that there are, um, the pandemic has produced a wide range of implications on parliamentary oversight and parliamentary work in general, but there are two main insights that I think we should take into consideration. First of all, there's a question that I would like to raise is that um, it's about the possibility to use virtual oversight practices in the future, whether these practices are desirable in the long run. And I think that these practices offer some advantages, but also disadvantages, because they are not always reliable. Uh, and most important, they can support uh, the use of fact-finding mechanism, but uh, um, they can, they probably, they are not equally reliable for those procedures that require a formal debate and the vote. Therefore, they can raise some problems for oppositions because they can uh, endanger the possibility of parliaments to make full use of their procedures of these tools. And the second insight is about uh, the, the future of, uh, um, of parliamentary oversight. 
uh, in the rollback of emergency registration. I think that uh, emergency really need to be, um, sorry, uh, oversight really need to be strengthened in perspective of the rollback of emergency legislation, because there are quite a, a large number of points that need to be controlled, uh, many issues that need to be monitored, I'm referring specifically to budgetary measures, to increasing public debt, to the need to monitor the implementation and unintended consequences of the COVID legislations, plans for reconstructions and so forth. So it's really in perspective of the um, of the stage two of the post-emergency that I think that parliamentary oversight need to be strengthened. And Parliament's capacity to address these challenges, I think that will be a marker of their ability to create opportunity out of the crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elena, for a very interesting and uh, uh, illuminating uh, presentation. I have uh, already uh, two questions from our panelists who want to ask questions, and I also had a couple of questions, but I'll defer first to uh, Jan and then uh, Ronan, and if people from the audience wants to, want to ask questions, so please go ahead and write in the Q&A. So Jan, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Elena, for a very informative and interesting paper in your presentation. Uh, so you trace the mechanisms of the parliamentary oversight. I was wondering whether you also collected some information on how the executives actually reacted to the, um, to the feedback provided by the parliaments, whether they have taken it into account or they uh, prefer to ignore it, or if uh, you have any idea on how the process developed further. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for this question with a very pivotal one. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't have uh, um, direct insights on the, on the follow-up of, uh, of, the, of the votes, for instance, of the directions voted in Parliament. But in general, I think that parliamentary oversight is a sort of paradox because it, it's, it works alongside the cleavage between uh, the executive and parliamentary majority. What's, what's voted in parliament, it's arranged. I think it's pre-arranged because it's the will of parliamentary majority, which is shared with, with, uh, with the government. So I think that we should, uh, I mean, votes are important and I'm really, um, fond of the liberative mechanism, as I mentioned in the paper. But I, I think that we need to look uh, um, not just uh, at, at the decisions taken in parliaments, but at the opportunity given to a position to state of will without taking our decisions. For instance, that's why I really believe that question time is important. It's just a wind, of course. It's just a tool for uh, sharing information, for stating position. But, I mean, it's the only opportunity that the position have to, to use formal procedures. So, I mean, but I, I mean, you're right. I think that the, the, the next stage will be to, to, to look at the follow-up, hmm, at the interaction. Uh, Ronald, if, if you can, uh, but a uh, relatively quick question, please. Okay, I'll make two very brief questions then. Um, on your list, Elena, I wasn't sure if I saw of you the six five or six different techniques if you included in that voting on legislation, because in the UK Parliament, one of the functions is to validate emergency regulations, which the executive has already passed. That's the first question. Second question, maybe a little bit more provocative. Why is Parliament better than the executive when it comes to things like balancing rights? Thank you very much for these two good questions. Um, I think, in my view, uh, the vote on emergency regulation is not strictly part of the oversight function because it's rather part uh, of the lawmaking or regulatory function, let's say. Um, uh, because, I mean, here it's part of the decision making. I mean, in my view, oversight is everything that does not strictly require. A, a direct decision from Parliament. So Parliament is scrutinizing the decision of someone else, of, of the executive. But of course, it's a, a theoretical perspective, which can be, I mean, we can discuss about this, I mean, whether it's part of not your side, of their side function. Um, and uh, uh, sorry, the second question uh, was about, uh, can you repeat it? The second question, why is Parliament better than the executive ah, yes. when it comes to balancing rights? 
Yes, um, two issues. It's transparency and pluralism. Transparency because, I mean, everything that's decided in Parliament, uh, it's shared with the public. I mean, procedures are there to be monitored, and not just by handpiece, but by the public as well. I mean, procedures, parliamentary procedures are a guarantee for a democratic decision. And this is not the case for executive decisions which are taken behind the curtains. And the second reason is of pluralism because parliament is the only single pluralist institutions that we have. Executives even uh, represent just one party or uh, I mean a coalition in case of coalition part governments, but they do not represent the entire uh, political um, uh, hierarchy of parties. Thank you very much, Elena. And uh, we now move to our uh, final uh, presentation by Phil Lord. Phil, please. Hi. Um, so my paper is on employment responses to the COVID crisis. Uh, the first thing I do in the paper is I describe the two main um, programs that have been adopted by North American governments uh, to respond to the crisis. So the first one is a very traditional um, employment insurance uh, program. And what we've seen both in Canada and the United States is that the program has been uh, expanded to cover people who were not traditionally covered um, under the EI program. So people who are self-employed and don't usually pay into um, EI programs, people who, are, who choose to be at home because uh, they're worried about contagion risk, people who are caring for someone who's sick from COVID-19 and so forth. Um, and th this is a, a very traditional thing that, that's been done in financial crises um, and also a very intuitive thing to do for governments. When, when people lose their job, the government has to have a program to make sure that these people are provided for. Uh, the other thing we've seen uh, from North American governments is a bit more um, innovative and um, it's basically the first time that it's been implemented and that's a payroll subsidy. So the government said basically uh, we'll, we'll pay companies, uh, we'll pay companies to keep employees on payroll um, and that was extended in Canada to basically cover most of an employee's salary. Um, and obviously the rationale behind that is uh, to, co to um, combat the incentive that's always existed with um, employment insurance. If, we, if the only program we have to provide for people who are unemployed during the crisis is uh, when they're unemployed, then obviously there's an incentive for companies to temporarily lay off their workers so they can benefit from these programs. Uh, and in, in, North American, uh, in North America, at least, we've, we've um, always had statutes that allow this type of temporary layoffs. So if a company is in a cash crunch, they're, they're typically allowed to lay off their workers temporarily. For that period of time, they don't pay them uh, wages. They'll pay for their ancillary benefits, typically pension benefits. They'll still accrue credit um, under these systems, but they'll be unemployed. They'll be able to claim uh, EI benefits under traditional EI systems. Um, and it, it's companies are able to move them off payroll without feeling too bad about it because they're provided for by the government. Um, the main issue with that program um, in Canada, at least, is, is that it was adopted very late. So initially, the only thing we had was the expanded EI program. And then a few days later, the government um, said uh, that they'd cover about 10% of payroll costs for companies. Obviously that didn't quite work out because for, for companies it wasn't particularly interesting to keep employees on payroll, pay them uh, the remaining 90% of their salary as opposed to lay, off, lay them off temporarily um, and then have to pay none of it. Um, my paper then um, critically analyzes these two responses and tries to come up with a plan that's more comprehensive and that more thoroughly integrates um, these, these two responses. Uh, the, the first problem I find is that um, essentially uh, the first issue um, with the Canadian program at least was that initially uh, people who paid into the EI system, so people who um, have jobs, um, are not self-employed and so forth, uh, were being processed under the EI system. Uh, and 
the expanded um, EI program, which we call the CRB in, in Canada, had a fixed payment of $2,000 a month, $2, a month um, for workers. People who were under the traditional EI system, however, got a portion of their salary, which would often be under $2,000. So that's my first criticism, um, that it's bizarre for people who pay into the EI system and fund their own benefits to get a lower benefit payment um, than, than people who effectively don't and benefit from the expanded program, which is funded by um, general tax revenue. The solution I propose is a tax credit. Uh, my point is basically that most of these people will never use the credit they'll um, accrue in the EI system uh, and that the EI system was created for situations just like this one. So it's better for them to actually use their credit in the EI system and then be compensated concurrently with a tax credit. Uh, since my paper was written, uh, the government decided to implement another solution, which is to, to not have anyone claim under the traditional EI system and process everybody under the COVID-19 expanded program. Obviously from a, a cost and cost allocation perspective, the results basically the same, uh, but, but people end up with credit under the EI system that they might never use. Um, the other point I make is more, um, is, is broader. So, my point is that um, both the EI subsidy, uh, the payroll subsidy and the EI system should be limited in scope uh, to control the, the cost of the programs uh, during COVID-19. So since my paper was written, we, we actually learned uh, from the Canadian government what their projected uh, deficit was. Uh, it was much higher than frankly anyone thought. We're at about 20% uh, of GDP which is the highest in the G7. And we also have the worst outcome uh, in the G7 in terms of unemployment. So, and that's on top of the fact, by the way, that these programs are likely to be extended uh, through December, which is gonna make um, the deficit far higher than expected. So my point is that in, in most um, developed countries, we've seen uh, unsustainable spending. Uh, obviously there ought to be spending to respond to the crisis, but if it's going to last for an indeterminate period of time, we have to be more careful about kind of rolling back the scope of these programs and making sure that people who can afford to pay for a portion of the, the cost of the crisis do so. So my point is that we should limit um, both uh, temporary layoffs, so prevent companies from laying off their workers so they can get EI and um, the payroll subsidy uh, to companies that are highly profitable. So. I suggest that we evaluate that um, relative to the number of workers that we encompass, that we encompass a, a longer period of time to make sure that we get a, a faithful idea of profitability over um, a full growth cycle. Um, and I also argue that we should exclude companies with um, high cash reserves, but that are not profitable on paper. That is um, a recognition of the fact that for some companies, uh, profit is not the priorities. Uh, the priority, there's uh, public companies like Amazon, which have historically not um, declared any profit, even though their gross, their, their gross margins were good because they wanted to reinvest in, in growth and R&D. Um, and if we're gonna have programs that extend to all companies, that's especially important because for private companies, there's very little of an incentive to, to have um, high profitability. So pr private companies don't have quarterly earning targets, um, don't have a large body of shareholders, um, and their main priority is often going to be minimizing their taxes. And the best way to do that is to minimize their profit. Um, so I argue that we should exclude companies based on, on cash reserves as well. Um, and it's worth emphasizing that this is only about temporary layoffs. So the government gives companies um, the right to temporarily lay off their workers in the first place, only to rehire them later on. And what I'm saying is that companies that are highly profitable shouldn't get that option. Uh, that doesn't mean that they can't lay off their workers permanently. They, they could do that. They wouldn't need to ask for permission. They just couldn't lay them off knowing that they'll rehire them later on. Um, and I also argue that the, the payroll subsidy, which is the equivalent of the EI system, uh, is a subsidy from the government to keep workers employed 
um, sh should also be limited um, not to cover these companies. So effectively, um, the, the main ideas are we should have a payroll subsidy and an expanded EI system, that they should be approximately equal, so there's no incentive for companies to lay off their workers. Uh, so it's, it's as, um, it, it's as uh, advantageous to keep them on as to lay them off, uh, and that these programs should be rolled back so that private actors who can afford the cost um, are, are made to bear some of the cost. My final point is about um, what we do with um, companies that I've just made ineligible for these programs, yet um, are in a major cash crunch and are going to go bankrupt. My personal position is that um, it's effectively an ideological position to say that we shouldn't help these companies um, and that at some point the government has a responsibility to manage systemic risk and make sure that companies don't go bankrupt. Uh, obviously that can create uh, what economists call moral hazard. So incentivizing companies to be irresponsible, to get rid of their cash, notably by distributing it to shareholders. Um, so the way I mitigate that is uh, to say that we help these companies with loans as opposed to grants, um, that these loans should be interest bearing and that these loans should be much less um, advantageous in terms of their terms than what is found in the private sector. And that kind of emphasizes my point that these are last resort facilities and that we let the private sector uh, take care of, of the cost, including uh, of these loans to the extent possible, and that the government only steps in as the last resort. Thank you very much, uh, Phil. This is a uh... Fascinating, and I think it was a very strong and persuasive uh, argument. I, I want to uh, tie to your last point about uh, uh, companies that might not survive uh, without help. And, and the question is, what do you do about uh, companies and industries that might not survive COVID-19 because of their subject matter? I'm thinking, for example, of travel agents, right? So it's possible that if COVID-19 will last very long, and it's, now it seems that it will last long. Some companies will have to completely, and some employers and employees will have to to find a completely different uh, uh, walk of, of uh, employment. So, would you think there's something separate that should be done in in certain categories or types of industries? Right. So, um, I think the the my my last point is mostly about companies that are otherwise. Um, financially stable. So I wouldn't necessarily extend that program to everybody because I think at the end of the day, even when there's interest, it's the, the taxpayer that's, that's bearing the risk. Um, and that, that program should arguably only cover um, c companies that, that we know are going to survive and just have liquidity problems. So there could be some sort of, of um, resiliency test um, on, on that front. Uh, more broadly, I think um, my personal opinion is that the government shouldn't necessarily be trying to uh, kind of ride the, the systemic changes um, that are happening um, in industry. Obviously, beyond limiting the scope of the programs, I, I don't think government has to say, well, we're not going to help the retail sector, for instance, at all, because um, their, their, their industry is under assault. I think we know from experience that these changes um, happen anyway, and they happen at a, a much faster rate today than they did 10, 20 years ago. Um, so, so I think the government should be careful with taxpayer money, but it, it shouldn't otherwise um, say, well, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll favor a transition to, um, to other sectors of the economy, which are more sustainable. Thank you. And uh, Ronan, you had a question as well? Um, yes, but maybe first I could answer your question, Itai, because very recently, um, the airline industry in the UK have been looking for money from the government um, for the reasons that you've suggested. And the government has, by and large, refused. And a couple of days ago, Richard Branson's firm, Virgin Atlantic, after having been refused by the government, decided it actually could raise the money itself and it raised several hundred million pounds itself. So um, 
sometimes the companies don't need the, the money themselves. But I had two questions really um, for Phil and they're kind of related and perhaps the answer is implicit in what you've said already. But do you think there are loopholes or else perverse side effects in the this EI and payroll subsidy legislation in the US and Canada? And if so, is that just poor design or is there something untoward going behind the scenes? And then a related question, again, maybe this is implicit. Do you think that some of the, this is a bit of a money grab by wealthy companies to get money out of the system? And I think in particular, the recent information about um, money that the US government has been giving out to people under the, the, the uh, essentially, they're, they're called loans, but they're a disguised form of subsidy. Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, so I think obviously there, there are perverse incentives built into these things, um, mostly by design. As I said, obviously EI incentivizes unemployment because it, it, it makes it easier for people to be unemployed. Um, I think it, it, we, we shouldn't try to remove that um, because we don't want people to starve when they're unemployed. I think it's more a matter of kind of mitigating these incentives as much as we can with um, other government programs that, that make it as attractive um, not to, to lay off a worker. Um, I think most of the issue is um, improper design of government programs. So I think, I don't think it's necessarily by, by design. I just think it's not well thought out. And traditionally, um, the things we've done during financial crises are just not the best things we could do. Uh, so pumping money into um, the financial markets with federal reserve banks, uh, bolstering employment insurance. These are things that that do prevent people from starving during the crisis, but they're not the most thoughtful things we can do to keep people employed and reboot the economy. Um, and this is a point I've made in, a, in another paper I wrote during COVID-19, um, which is forthcoming in, in a law journal. And um, what I effectively say is that, that people um, from the middle class have traditionally been left out during financial crises. So governments are concerned with systemic risk, saving companies, pumping liquidity into financial markets. But at the end of the day, that doesn't benefit um, normal people. They don't get loans, they don't get grants. The only thing they get is some, um, some vague assurance that they won't lose their job because there is more money in financial markets. Um, so I don't think that's by design. I think it's more um, inexperience on the part of governments. And we have to remember that most of these programs were created during COVID-19. Um, and they're, they're actually better ideas than what we've had in prior crises. So I think it's going to get better over time. Uh, and even if there's, there's much criticism of them, it, it, it's still very promising um, in, in, in terms of a, of a shift in how we help people during financial crises. Um, the other thing I'd say is, um, I think the, the main issue is every program or decision that is administered through the private sector tends to benefit wealthy companies. So in the United States, we did see that the, basically was a payroll subsidy. The government would create loans for businesses, um, which were called small businesses, but it could be up to 500 employees. We saw billion dollar companies that, that were helped. Um, and indeed, the, the claims that were processed were mostly from, from large companies that, that got it. The reason for that um, is that it was administered through banks. And the, the government said, we're guaranteeing the loans, but we're not making the loans. The banks are making the loans. Well, when you're a bank, uh, your, your own um, financial interest is to help your good clients first. Um, and um, the, what the banks did is they went to their biggest clients first, processed their claims faster um, to develop banking relationships with their, their large clients. And eventually the program ran out of money before it could help uh, small businesses. So I, much of that could have been solved by, by appropriating more money uh, to these programs. The, the, the money that was first allocated was insufficient. 
uh, but also I think governments could have been more aggressive in, um, in, in creating criteria to make sure that, um, that these programs are administered in a way that doesn't discriminate against clients that are uh, smaller companies or that don't have uh, a longstanding banking relationship with the banks that's administering the program. Thank you very much, uh, Phil. And uh, we do have a few more minutes for questions uh, uh, from the audience to, to all panelists. So maybe I'll start. We have four uh, pending questions. I, I hope we'll uh, have time for at least some of them. I'll start uh, with the most uh, recent one um, from Judith uh, Gleason, which asks, ask, is it a matter for the judiciary or the legislature to set the sunset clause for emergency legislation. Uh, sounds like a question that's very relevant both to uh, Ronan and Jan, but of course, Elena and Phil, uh, feel free to uh, reply as well. So maybe, Jan, do you want to start? Uh, yes, sure. Um, well, uh, I think in terms of uh, that uh, the, the sunset clause is a matter of a broader legislative strategy. So uh, it might be uh, more appropriate for the political branches for, uh, for the uh, executive or legislature to, uh, to set it. But um, I mean, uh, courts in uh, prior emergencies uh, show to be able to uh, somewhat um, review these uh, issues, what I have in mind are especially uh, the criteria set by the European Court of Human Rights on uh, reviewing uh, Article 15 derogations in times of emergencies where the European Court uh, came with a set of issues that it uh, reviews both procedural issues and substantive issues where uh, the Strasbourg Court um, looks whether uh, the derogation uh, is uh, really required by the ex exigencies of the uh, of the given situation so uh, in some i believe it's mostly for the political branches uh, but in uh, in the event of passivity i believe courts can step in as well thank you uh, ronan um, uh, very little to add. I agree with Jan. It should be for the legislature and then the legislation, but it makes sense if it's reviewable in some way by the judges. Sorry, if I can add something. Um, sunset clauses are usually set in the legislation, and in my view, they are a really effective tool for supporting post legislative scrutiny which is a mean for scrutinizing how legislation is implemented, and especially for supporting post-legislative scrutiny in parliament, not just at the executive level, but also in parliament, because parliaments are sometimes complementing the post-legislative scrutiny, which is conducted at the executive level. And having this pluralistic view, uh, this pluralistic contribution to post-legislative scrutiny increases the opportunity to, to, to monitor uh, the effectiveness of legislation, of the implementation of legislation. So I think that it's good to have some disclosures in, in, in the legislation and to open the, 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 the post-legislative scrutiny, not just to executive actors, but also to parliamentary actors. Thank you. Uh, Phil, do you want to add anything to this uh, question? Well, I just um, had a question actually for, for Ronan. Um, pretty simple one. Um, I'm just wondering to what extent do you think your um, argument applies differently in countries where the executive branch is merged with the, the legislative branch and, and, and therefore where um, the population will have um, elected a, a government that intrinsically has um, the power to limit the debate on, on various uh, legislative provisions? Yeah, I think it really depends on the political culture within that country. And it's not a good idea if they're merged to such an extent that the legislature will simply rubber stamp anything that the executive does. I think that's a much broader question that we can't really solve through legislation in itself. But I think the key issue is that it should be 
um, an independent and separate decision, sort of echoing um, Elena's point about proper oversight from someone outside and independence. And just following up from that, I, I noticed another question about sunset clauses. Perhaps if I can just um, look at that. Um, how can we involve, avoid indefinite extension of sunset clauses, for example, in Hungary? And is there some sort of criteria for that? I think that is a really important question. And again, that's to do with political culture within a country, but there are ways that you can structurally do that by having criteria built in within the legislation, within the sunset clause itself. If you have criteria that say, um, the government must come back every six months and before they come back asking for an extension, they must produce a report and the report must set out the reason that it is necessary for the extension and the evidence some sort of structured procedure that you can certainly assist the parliament by giving it the tools necessary to properly hold the executive to account. But again, that's with that, that's again a question of political culture. And if you have um, a really strong executive, which, is, which has got great um, parliamentary results, it is very difficult to actually do anything about it. Thank you. Maybe uh, we have time for a couple more questions. I'll start with uh, the most recent question from Brazil. Uh, so the question from Hugo Henry Suarez. Uh, in Brazil, we see judges and courts creating policies and determining actions for the executive in the fight against COVID. What do you think about that? So I think this is uh, relevant for all panelists uh, that want to uh, engage with the question. So please. Well, if I can give an answer, I would refer to the paper we had by Pinheiro and Elaraz on the special edition um, on Brazilian uh, approaches. And it seems my understanding is that the different branches of government are doing quite an, an effective job at restraining um, the very bad decisions of the Brazilian president. So. I don't think they should be creating policies in judges, judges and courts shouldn't really be, be, be creating, but if they're scrutinizing in some way or holding to account or acting as a balance, then that seems to be sensible to me. Maybe if I may uh, add a point of my own. Uh, uh, first of all, I'll echo uh, Ronan's point that uh, uh, I strongly suggest the Brazilian paper we'll have in our special issue. And uh, Ronan has just uh, written in the chat for all the uh, attendance, the link for our special issue. So you're welcome uh, uh, to go there and, and look. Uh, I think that Brazil is interesting in, in a way that uh, most of the discussions we had today, certainly by Jan and, and uh, Elena, is the usual uh, situation that we uh, envision is that uh, we have an executive or, or the head of the executive uh, saying this is a great threat. We need to take very uh, far-reaching measures, and then it's the role of the judiciary and the legislature to hold them back. Brazil is very interesting in the in the sense that you have a head of an executive saying this is not a serious threat and does not want to take actions, and then the question is what is the role of the legislature and the judiciary maybe forcing uh, the executive to do uh, uh, something about the pandemic and do take actions. Uh, anybody else from the panelists want to say anything about uh, the Brazilian question or should we move on? Yeah, just very briefly to uh, answer Hugo's question. When, when I was writing the paper, I had in mind the context of executive overreach as, uh, as the very pressing trend of these days. But actually, I think Brazil, along with the US, for instance, is, a, is an example of what uh, Kim Lane Skepel in a recent paper calls uh, executive underreach. So uh, it seems to me that this is a whole new uh, context to think about the involvement of the uh, other branches, especially the judiciary, when the, um, when the executive is, uh, is passive. And it seems to me that in, in, in such context, uh, judicial activism may be justified from the viewpoint of necessity that uh, whoever can should do something. But again, here are uh, all the problems with, that we discussed with the legitimacy and uh, scientific knowledge uh, on part of the judiciary. So I think the Brazilian um, case is extremely interesting and opens up 
many, many new uh, research avenues. Uh, if I may just add a few words uh, in general, I think that the question deals with the limit of uh, judicial review of legislation, the problems of interpretive or non interpretive uh, jurisprudence. But uh, generally speaking, I do believe that courts uh, are often filling in the gaps opened by political bodies. So I think that we should start with saying that political bodies should adopt better laws, um, avoiding to, to leave too broad margins on interpretation to judges. So let's start from this, I would say. Thank you, Phil. Do you want to add something on this point? No. Okay. So I, I think we have time for uh, one more question that uh, was originally sent uh, to you, uh, Ronan. And I'm referring to the question by uh, Murray Hunt. Can Ronan clarify the relationship between his socially distanced emergency legislation and legislation which derogates from the ECTH, ECHR or other human rights? Presumably, he's not advocating derogation for all health emergency legislation, only for any provisions in which we are compatible with such rights. So there is such a thing as non-derogating emergency legislation, which like derogating legislation must also be strictly limited to the duration of the emergency. Um, that's a very useful question. Um, I think we can decouple the two issues entirely. Um, derogations are one thing, and I am agnostic about whether a derogation is necessary. Sometimes it might be, sometimes it might not be helpful, but regardless of whether or not you derogate, you still have to have the social distancing of the legislation. So I certainly wouldn't recommend that simply carte blanche, we always derogate from human rights provisions. But even if we don't derogate, we still have to recognize that these are emergency powers and they still should be time limited. It still should have a sunset clause um, within them. One aspect of the derogation does make it much more conceptually clear that this is a very much an emergency law, not an ordinary law. So in one sense, the derogation helps this social distancing concept, but it is not a necessary prerequisite to have a derogation before you have that social distancing of emergency legislation. Okay, so in, in the uh, two minutes we have left, I, I, I cannot resist my temptation. I'll, I'll ask one question to uh, Elena and if other participants would want to have a, a short uh, view on it as well. So Elena, you mentioned in one aspect uh, the, the role of the opposition. And I'm wondering whether in a type of the structural solutions to ensure real, real scrutiny by the and oversight by the legislature, uh, do you think it's worthwhile to say that the, there must be, for example, like they did in New Zealand, that the, Special Committee on the Coronavirus is headed by a, a, a chair from the opposition. And, and although all parties are represented, the opposition has a one person majority there. Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, this is one of the most common solutions. Uh, the the, the, the fact-finding mission that I was mentioning uh, in France is now headed by the, by the speaker, but in the second stage it will be headed by a member of the opposition. And this is a, a widely used uh, solution to ensure opposition uh, due rights to, to intervene and participate. But I would say that in general, all parliamentary procedures are structured to combine the rights of majority to support the government with the right of opposition to stay their will. So I will really, I much rely on the, on the strength and the solidity and the inclu inclusiveness of parliamentary procedures in protecting every single parliamentary procedure on questioning and uh, government statements about everything, supporting opposition beyond a majority. Thank you very much. So uh, this concludes our uh, our uh, webinar uh, today. And uh, uh, Liam, if you want to uh, put on uh, the final slide, please. So this is uh, the time to do so. And meanwhile, I will want to uh, thank again all our speakers, uh, uh, Ronan, Jan, Elena, and Phil for their wonderful presentations, and all of you uh, viewers from around the world for your uh, question and your participation.
uh, I, I would say that this was the second out of three webinars in our series. And uh, the next webinar will take place on July 22nd. You'll be able to uh, see it on the website of the Bingham Center. And finally, I would like to thank the Bingham Center for the rule of law that organized this event. Uh, as you can see in the slide, uh, uh, you can see the recording of the webinar on their website. And if you enjoyed uh, today's uh, uh, webinar, please consider uh, making a donation to support the Bingham Center through uh, this current time of uncertainty. Thank you very much to you all.